I think in my opinion, we veterinarians were placed in a leadership role and working alongside, of course, the regulatory agencies. But we we were able to influence how they moved their pigs, how they vaccinated, when they vaccinated. And it, and it was really, even though consulting medicine was prior to that, um, I think it all kind of came together about the same time. So we, as, as a veterinarian, I mean, I had several hats. I'd go to the bankers with the producers or I'd do this with them or whatever because we helped them eliminate and control a very important pathogen. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me in our podcast studios this week is Dr. Tom Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie is a private practitioner with Performance Health. Tom, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Uh, we've known each other for a long time, and I'm super excited to pick your brain. But before we get started with that, in case there's folks out there that haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, why don't we start with a, just a little introduction and some background? Excellent. I'm tickled to be on here today, Clayton. Uh, this is I listen to a lot of your podcast and, and love them. So I graduated from Purdue University long before you guys ever thought about being veterinarians. And I'll leave it at that. Then I transitioned into uh, mixed animal practice. But you know, we practitioners like to follow our passions. And so about 1985, 86, I was doing nothing but pig work. That transitioned into starting my own practice, Rensselaer Swine Service in Rensselaer, Indiana. And I was given an opportunity in 1997 to work in Denmark to help Boinger Ingelheim figure out why the vaccine wasn't working the same as it was here, PERS vaccine. And so that kind of started and morphed into my international part of my practice. So I've been well blessed. I've seen all kinds of places in the world like you. Um, but yeah, this has been fun. It's been a good ride. I'm looking at our profession in a rearview mirror type look versus the younger professionals that are looking at it in the headlight view. So I'll add that. <laughs> Headlights is exactly what it feels like someday. That's a very good analogy. And I'm sure that hasn't changed a whole lot from uh, throughout the years of your practice. Um, you you mentioned uh, you know starting your your practice out with a mixed animal and then focusing on swine and um, you would have dealt with a disease that some younger veterinarians have not had to deal with and that's pseudo rabies. Um, do you want to talk, Doctor Tom, about um, you know what was the pig industry like when we were uh, fighting pseudo rabies and then ultimately eradicating pseudo rabies? You know what what was the industry like? What were some key differences there? And then what have you what have you noticed on the back end of pseudo rabies? How did how did the pseudo rabies elimination program transform the pig industry? Uh, very good questions, Clayton, and very thoughtful. <clears throat> so PRV is. It's a DNA virus, and of course that means it's a little bit more stable. We don't have all the all the new recombinations and everything that we do with PERS. But at that time in practice, we were not we were wearing the same boots, same cover halls, going from farm to farm. The farms were small, uh, so we had no concept of biosecurity. But there was a lot of things we learned with PRV. For instance, if we could vaccinate properly with a very good vaccine, by the way, um, we had tremendous success in not allowing that virus to get into the trigeminal nuclei and then become lifelong shedders, so to speak. Um, so there was our beginnings of learning. Oh, the other aspect of uh, PRV, I think that was important, is animal flow. So we had. Basically, single site units, 100 sal units, you know, were considered pretty big at that time, 150 sal. Um, today, you know, you got them up to 10,000. That's one row. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So, 
that was a part of the industry. And another aspect that really made an impact in me as a young veterinarian in the early 80s, we had batch farrowing in single in single site units. And I had a unit that was about 85 sows to 100 sows. It eliminated PRV virus simply by vaccinating and then the batch farrowing. So that started me thinking about animal flow. How do we use that as a tool in our work with population medicine? And then, of course, in the late 80s, the industry just exploded with growth. And we had other leaders like Dr. Brett Marsh, who you have interviewed, showed a lot of um, insight in how we could work with the uh, state veterinary in our uh, state here to help us understand movement of pigs and how that came into it so we could not infect other sites or even other states. So all that became morphed into what we call biosecurity today, I think. I think that's where it started, Clayton. The components of biosecurity that we think of today, were they generally just adopted voluntarily by producers, Tom? Or were some of those components things that were a part of the pseudo rabies control program and a part of, say, a regulatory push to improve biosecurity? Um, is, is that another way? Is Are the biosecurity steps, were they something kind of forced on the producers as part of the regulatory program? Or no, producers said, hey, I've, you know, if I've gotten rid of it, I don't want to get it back. And I'm open to making these changes, um, even if it's a new... I guess, an entirely new approach to managing disease I hadn't thought of before. No, I think in my opinion, we veterinarians were placed in a leadership role and working alongside, of course, the regulatory agencies. But we we were able to influence how they moved their pigs, how they vaccinated, when they vaccinated. And it, and it was really, even though consulting medicine was prior to that, um, I think it all kind of came together about the same time. So we, as, as a veterinarian, I mean, I had several hats. I'd go to the bankers with the producers or I'd do this with them or whatever because we helped them eliminate and control a very important pathogen. Do you think, uh, Dr. Tom, there's opportunities for us to use similar approaches with uh, PRV elimination and enhanced biosecurity to better manage specific diseases today? Or said another way, what's the what's the disease that's the best opportunity to take those lessons learned and make it better compared to how we're doing it right now? Oh, that's another thought. Very insightful question, Clayton. I think um, the industry is primed to control and eliminate P PED virus. And I think some of the aspects we learned back then, we can apply today. You know, we need it to be producer driven. We need leaders in the veterinary side to help say, hey, let's stay between the white lines here, not not drive off the road, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, there's got to be some um, joint effort there. But I think that's another pathogen that we could eliminate out of this country. We wouldn't have necessarily a, a vaccine for the PED elimination. At least I shouldn't say it this way. Not a vaccine that we'd probably use in the same way we did the pseudo rabies vaccine. Um, how would you manage the immunological part of that uh, elimination for PED, Dr. Tom? Do you think is there anything we need to do, or do you think we can do it without that vaccine being a key part of the elimination program? I think we can do it without the vaccine. Uh, I worked with Mike Murtall early on and yeah the vaccine does help you know with the immunity side of that whole disease but i think we need to look at that in a different frame and say hey let's let's rely on biosecurity practices that we know about and make those work and not drag this virus back from harvest plants or from another site. It's not a, it's not a, it's absolutely not where it's coming from, right? It's generally the slaughter plant or something that's connected to it. And, and talk about biosecurity. You know, we're one of the, one of the hardest jobs to do is wash a trader trailer and disinfect it. 
And I read an article here not too long ago about a whole different process that we need to look at in these trailers to see if we can vacuum them out and then gas them in some way. I mean, that's exciting stuff, even for an old vet like me. Yeah. Thinking outside the box is always fun. Yes. What about producer buy-in? Can you think back to the pseudo rabies elimination program and how producers got bought in then? And are there any lessons learned we can harvest from that to apply it to PED to get somebody that says, I'm not willing to go on that journey or I don't want the extra cost of, uh, you know, where the producers can go sometimes, right? I don't want the extra cost of my trailer sanitation. I don't believe your vacuum thing works. That's focus, <laughs> focus, right? for those folks that maybe need some incentive or, or need, need help getting over the hump. Are there any lessons? learned from pseudo rabies on how we got producers aligned towards one goal that we can apply to that problem. Well, I think that comes back to it has to be producer driven. You know, I, I don't want to get to the point where the regulatory agencies say, hey, you're not going to be able to ship pigs anymore. But if if we do our foundation of information, laying that foundation of that information correct, then I think we'll have an 80-20 buy-in, and it'd be 20% of the producers that just for whatever reason, they're not going to jump on it. And that's where we got to become salesmen. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boring or Ingelheim representative to learn more. With um, pseudo rabies, my perspective is that maybe the the 20% that weren't the initial adopters, that once they saw other people being successful and saw, okay, you got rid of that bug in other herds and the performance has gotten better, I would assume that the 20% kind of shifted into the adopter mode over time and maybe similar with PED. The first year, not everybody buy, not everybody buys in, but as they see the people that did buy in being successful, hopefully it's a rolling ball of moss that gathers steam. Absolutely. And it it just people come along success. You got to build that foundation with success. And then the others that are just kind of standing back and saying, hey, I'm going to watch this thing for a little bit before I spend any money on it. And hey, they're having success. I want to be a part of that, too. Very good. Fantastic information. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, Dr. Gillespie. Uh, very practical and insightful as always. Very good. It was my pleasure, Clayton. Yeah, well, Tom, we couldn't do this without the folks that are out there listening. Um, we should thank the audience here before we wrap up. Uh, and to the audience, if you haven't checked out our website, please go to the swinehealthblackbelt.com. You can see this episode with Dr. Tom, as well as all the other episodes that we've done. Uh, and if you would, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a message. That helps to, to build momentum and get this good information out to other producers and other veterinarians. Uh, for Dr. Tom Gillespie, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Take care.